Um, so first, thank you so much for coming so early. I think I've woken up the earliest I have in a long time because I'm a student. Um, and thank you for coming to my talk. I know there's loads of really cool stuff on. Um, I only have my notes available on my laptop, so I'm going to simultaneously click through this presentation and also this, so there might be a bit of mismatch, and I hope that's okay. Um, firstly, who am I? I've been given a short introduction already. Um, I'm a Max Planck researcher at the... Yeah, I'm a PhD researcher at the Max Planck Institute. And normally my um, kind of research is in empathy, stress, and endocrinology. Um, so what I'm going to present today is actually kind of one of my side hustles. Um, I'm really interested in science communication and bringing science to the public, and one of the ways in which I do that is through music and is through events, so I'm always trying to just get involved in other things. Um, so today, I'm going to be talking about the Brainstorms project. Not sure, should, there should be some sound on this. I'm not sure if, ah, yeah. Okay, <laughs> um, I won't give you too much info already, but what I will tell you is that, um, yes, that broadly this Brainstorms project was uh, across two themes. One of these is scientific. Oh, I can actually see my notes here, so that's, that makes my life a lot easier. Um, so one of these is uh, scientific, so the relationship between emotion and music, and the other is artistic, so how we can use this kind of information in order to kind of bridge uh, the scient scientific, musical, and artistic relationship. Um, yeah, and of course, how these influence each other. So a bit of background on music and emotion is that, yeah, I'm sure we all know that music has the power to evoke really powerful emotions. And it's thought that we, the emotions are elicited from music about 50% of the time that we actually listen to it. Um, we can use music to amplify our current emotional state. So for example, if we've gone through a breakup, if something bad has happened to us, we might listen to sad music in order to amplify those emotions. And similarly, we can use music to alter our emotional state. So we might listen to like some hypes, uh, some like techno or something to hype us up for a night out. Um, and so I wonder if any of you have kind of experienced like a very, a very intense feeling when you listen to music, which was yeah formally described as chills. Do, do people know what I mean by chills? Okay. So not everyone has experienced chills, so I'll go through a couple of definitions. Um, yeah, so a spreading of goose flesh, hair on end feeling that is common to the back of the neck and head and often moves across the spine. Or a particularly intense euphoric response to music, frequently accompanied by an autonomic or psychophysiological component. Um, yeah, so these can be called music evoked chills. And as I mentioned, they produce a physiological response. So this means increased skin conductance. You might feel a bit sweaty um, or increased heart rate and also an increased respiration rate. It's also been shown that we have a neuroscientific response when we experience chills. So when we have a chill, this kind of coincides with brain areas involved in emotion and reward and motivation and even motor kind of, yeah, motor, motor processing. And we also can have different types of chills. So a lot of research has kind of been compiled, and there was a really cool review just a couple of years ago, and what they found is that it can basically, chills can basically be divided into three different types. So these are warm chills associated with positive, valent feelings. So, wow, this song is really incredible, and I feel euphoric, and I want to dance. Uh, cold chills, which are associated with kind of negatively valenced emotions. So, wow, I'm really resonating with a sad emotional theme. And also moving chills. So this is kind of more to do with the feeling of awe or inspiration when we listen to a song. And it's kind of the chill that we can't really put into words. So what causes chills? Well, again, there seems to be kind of three elicitors. Uh, one of these is acoustic. So this has, it's been shown that chills often coincide with increased loudness, increased roughness, 
um, and we can have musical listers as well. So this, the reason it's got kind of these, this uh, mountain picture is because it's often been described as dramatic peaks and valleys within the music. So for example, big crescendo or build up or climaxes within the music. We can also have emotional elicitors. So this is basically the emotions that are conveyed by, by the composer of the music, and it might be a subjective feeling to the people listening. So why do they occur? Well, there, there's actually quite a few theories, and to be honest, a lot of them I kind of don't really like very much. Um, there's, there's this big evolutionary theory, which there is just no, no evidence for, and it's just people kind of just making up things. Um, but one of the ones that kind of are, are a bit more solid is, yeah, this one about the violation expecta of expectations. So generally, when we grow up, we, we are exposed to certain types of music, and we develop an expectation, we develop a cultural um, interest of what the music should sound like. And this differs between cultures. So for example, in Eastern culture, uh, often the major and minor scale is actually reversed to Western cultures. So something that we might consider quite sad, they might actually consider quite happy. So we all have this kind of framework of what music should listen we should sound like in our culture. Um, and when this is violated, when we hear something that we don't expect, um, this, this kind of creates this violation, which might cause a, a chill. Um, a similar theory is the ITPRA, which stands for Imagination, Tension, Prediction, Reaction, Appraisal. So this is actually quite similar to what I was talking about before. This is when because we have like a rapid fear response, which causes uh, this kind of pilo erection, which is the hairs standing on our arms, um, we suddenly get this kind of fright, like why is this happening? And then that is joined with this kind of positive um, outcome of the music, which could be, um, yeah, a violation, a delay, or even an extreme confirmation of what we want to hear. Um, and this creates this feeling of like a positive chill. Um, and also there are individual differences in who chills occur to. So one of the personality traits which has been most uh, associated with chills is openness to experience. So yeah, it's been by far documented that people who are curious, innovative, imaginative, and sensitive to the arts experience chills more than other people. And also, I mean, th there's loads of things, but I'm just gonna talk about empathy because I'm an empathy researcher. Um, so generally, people who can empathize well are either uh, thought to empathize with the emotion that the musician is trying to convey or with the emotion of that uh, kind of the sentiment of the song itself. So now that we've spoken a bit about emotion and chills, we're going to talk about the Brainstorms project. So I'm sure that most of you have heard of Pink Floyd, if you're not like Gen Z or something. Um, and I'm sure most of you have heard of the album uh, Dark Side of the Moon. Does, does anyone know how old this album is? Yeah, yeah, 50, 50 years. Someone, someone's been reading the program very well because I, I do have it in the, in the talk there, in the blurb. And so, uh, yes, it's uh, 50 years old. And so ba basically they wanted a way to celebrate this. Um, Rick Wright, the keyboardist of Pink Floyd, he actually died in 2008 and his daughter has inherited like Rick Wright music and yeah, kind of a lot of the rights to do with that. And it turns out Gala is really cool. And she was extremely bored of Pink Floyd just doing more album releases, more pretty colors, and just basically uh, creating more merchandising for fans to buy. And so she thought, let's actually do something cool with this. Let's try and do something which is kind of in line with kind of the mo modern society. And so she teamed up with some musicians and some artists in order and some neuroscientists to create this Brainstorms project. So this is, yeah, this is kind of a picture of it happening. This is actually William Orbit, who is a producer from the UK. Um, we took 125 participants, which is a lot, and we managed to test them all in one week, which is pretty crazy. But I think if you have the Pink Floyd name on something, you can just, you can just get participants. It's way easier than usual, usual research. Um, and we took EEG data collection. So this is this little cap that you can see on his head. 
And EEG is basically, this, this cap has got these kind of 14 different electrodes. You can actually have up to 64, but for this experiment, we didn't need too many. Um, and each one of these electrodes takes uh, the electrical activity running across the brain. So that's the raw data. And then you can feed this into algorithms or just look at the raw data itself. Um, and they listen to the last track on the album, which is called Great Gig in the Sky. And the reason why this track was chose, chosen is because it has a voice in it, so that it, but it doesn't have any lyrics. So often in a kind of chill and emotion research, there is a, there is a bias because a lot of it's kind of played by the lyrics, um, which have an emotional meaning themselves. But in this song, it was just kind of the pure voice that they were having an emotional reaction to. Um, it's also a naturalistic design. And yeah, it was through this incredible sound system called Dolby, which was yeah, just fantastic to listen to. Um, so this is, this is one of my results. This is my result. I can't show you all the results yet, but I'm just going to show you mine. You can see these kind of four colors through, throughout, and I'll just go a little bit more into them. You can see that these uh, electrodes are fed into four metrics of interest, relaxation, and stress, and excitement. And you can also see these numbers, which is how many points I scored higher than everyone else. So with the blue, you can see that I'm more relaxed than everyone else, but I'm also more stressed than everyone else, um, which <laughs> I guess just goes to show that I am just very emotionally chaotic, which I knew anyway, so yeah. Um, and then you can see these yellow lines, which is every time I experience a chill. So I had to tap a space bar every time I experienced a chill. And we can also compare these to the group results. So these red bars are kind of where, like the cumulative amount of everyone experiencing a chill. So if you compare those red bars to my yellow lines, you can see I was kind of experiencing chills in like most of the places that other people were. Um, which is interesting, right? Because it kind of shows that maybe we all experience chills at the same point with the music, but there is, is of course, variation in this. Um, yeah, this is, we can do a lot of this data. It's really cool because it's a dense recording of a single track across a long time. Um, we've also got a huge number of participants, and it makes it really ideal to contrast neuroscientific responses across um, yeah, the chill score. So using this behavioral chill data, we could potentially train a machine learning model in order to predict what neural responses respond to chills. Um, yeah, like I said, this isn't just about the science. This is about a, an artistic, creative uh, kind of outcome that we can use to give something back to participants, give something back to Pink Floyd fans. Um, and so what I'm going to show you now is kind of the data visualization that was created. Um, I think this should also have sound as well. It will come on in a minute. So as you can see, the clouds, the stress is the cloud darkening and the contrast glow. Um, and then, yeah, the excitement was shown by the cloud billowing and turbulence. We had interest by the star field twinkling slash flux and relaxation, which was an enveloping fog. So yeah, you'll kind of see a few, we, I won't go through the whole thing, but you'll just kind of see each kind of visualized. So this is the twinkling, which shows interest. And then this is relaxation, which is the enveloping fog. Yeah, and then immediately after becoming relaxed, I become stressed. Um, through this, yeah, cloud darkening and contrast glow. And then there's some cloud billowing as well, which shows some excitement. I am not and I think that's because I'm excited <laughs> about what's to come. Um, and this was actually after I, I, I had been testing participants the whole week. And this, I, I think I did this right at the end just so that we could have an example to show people. And yeah, I, I, even after listening to the song like 60, 70 times throughout the week, I was still experiencing chills. I was still experiencing excitement. And that is quite uh, conforming to the literature that if we kind of really go through a song many times over the first week, we're still able to experience this chill effect 
And then after a couple of weeks, it starts to, yeah, it starts to plateau and then kind of descend. Um, yes. Uh, so what next? Well, with the scientific data, I guess we actually have to analyze the data properly. We're, we've got yeah, this kind of raw data, which I've shown you in these metrics. Uh, but we really need to kind of look at the group effects. And so we're working with some professors. I've tried to connect them to the, some Max Planck professors involved in music. Um, yeah, so what we can look at is, is there a neuroscientific response, a specific neuroscientific response across individuals that creates an increased propensity to feel a chill at the same or a different time point? And can we train a machine learning model to investigate whether there is a neural signature which is associated with chill? And artistic, well, we have, next month, we are going to be doing a real-time visualization in a fully immersive atmosphere. I don't, has anyone been to Kunstkraftwerk in Leipzig? Maybe, yeah. It's, it's basically one of those in London. Um, yeah, this is like an idea of what it kind of looks like. I can't show you what it's actually going to look like yet. Um, but you basically walk into this room and you've got this visualization and we're going to be doing like real-time data so you can have your brain uh, you can listen to the song, have the EEG done, and then 15 minutes later walk into the room. We, we could do it real time, but we wanted the participants to like, actually be able to see what's happening 15 minutes later. So this will be running all through June uh, every weekend. So if you happen to be in London during that time, please come and say hello to me. Um, yes, so Pink Floyd have had many re-releases. Oh, yeah, this is kind of the conclusion. Uh, music and emotion are intrinsically linked. Music has the power to evoke strong physiological, emotional, and neuroscientific responses. And we can use this data to create per personalized visualizations of our experiences. Yeah, Pink Floyd have had many re-releases, con concerts, and ultimately banned centralized anniversaries. And I think Gala envisioned a celebration of the album, which counted out this kind of worn out commercialism and kind of went back to the roots of Pink Floyd and Dark Side of the Moon, which really aimed to explore artistic avenues and like put a modern twist on this. I think centering the fans in the process is a really nice way to kind of create an unforgettable, fully immersive experience. I would like to thank all the partners who are involved in this, and especially um, Richard Pollan and Gala Wright, who made this project possible. And I will end with some shameless self-promo, which is that I have an Instagram account, which was spoken about before, that you can follow me on, where I, yeah, I have some like infographics and stuff, uh, mainly mainly related to kind of sex hormones and uh, yeah, vaginas, because that's what I'm interested in. Um, but also I create my own events. So there is the Quantum Entanglement Festival, which fuses music, science, and art, which will be happening on the 7th of September in Leipzig, which you're also welcome to follow and welcome to come to. I will try and answer questions as best I can. But as I said, this isn't really my specific research area, so I don't know how broad I can go, but I, I will try. If, it, if it's related to empathy, I can probably answer it. Thank you. <laughs>